Ladies and gentlemen, it is my distinct uh, honor this evening to introduce our guest of honor, our 38th Commandant, General David Berger. I was thinking of uh, General Faulkner's comment about the best of the best. That's true. I, I think the second part of what you said, the best of the best, we should think about tonight. In other words, we're, high, we're lifting up each one of you all, rightfully so. But you really represent the other best, right? The entire Marine Corps, who is what this nation leans on. Tonight is all about you, and it should be. But you reminded me the best of the best. There's, we're, pretty good, we're in pretty good shape <laughs> as, a, as a nation, as long as there are 34,000 Marines who are on the job a, away from home. That's not a bad place to be. When things are really wacky, we're really crazy, it's a pretty good feeling to know that the other best that aren't in this room, we're, we're, in, we're in real good shape. Um, I think uh, Leanne and all the team, I would say, I would, I'm, I'm not going to go through all the thank yous and recognitions because two people have done it and if, I, if I'll ask, I just ask your permission if I can skip that first step, but that doesn't cut it short at all. When General Faulkner called me, he and I and General Smith and Sergeant Major talked about should we have this tonight? And the easiest thing would have been what? No, right? That would have been the easiest, safest thing to do, just cancel. All I'm, all I'm uh, starting from is uh, I'm glad we didn't. I'm glad Leanne and the hotel and General Smith and 50 other people somehow didn't take the easy route of it's just better, let's just cancel. We should take a couple minutes and recognize what Marine Corps leadership is all about. And I'm really glad we didn't take the easy route. I know there's risks. But I'm really glad we didn't take the easy route because most everything seems like cancel. Um, this is kind of a hybrid like you, you and I were talking before. So in one way, I was thinking, listening to General Smith, we're all dressed up like you guys are in coat and tie and we're in the uniform and ladies are in dresses and the pe people on the camera are probably like in sweatpants. This not good, okay? Somehow it's not fair at all. Like, they're like on their couch, they have a beer, they're in their sweatpants, like this is great. I'm not sure, we have to work on the hybrid part, in other words, there should be some dress code if you're gonna, I'm glad the people in fr fr from home are part of this. Industry, just a moment about industry, and then I'll, then I'll move on, because it's not about industry. I didn't un really understand industry till probably uh, five or six years ago, honestly, because as a Marine, you don't really pay attention to it. They give you your gear, and you, you're really happy you got good gear, and that's all there was to it. But now, now I really understand. The folks in this room represent companies, in other words, that make us capable of war fighting. The moment we lose that touch point and we become separated from industry, I think the major and the gunny and everybody else is going to be in real trouble because we'll buy equipment and we'll do stuff that doesn't, doesn't work. I'm really grateful for where we are now. And I was initially scared to death of talking to industry, being anywhere in the room with industry because I thought there was something illegal or unethical or a real problem. Now I'm like, no, no way. They, they want to understand what he needs to operate. He needs to talk directly to them. I need to be able to do this. Can you make that happen? Staff Sergeant needs the same thing. So I'm really learning more and more every year about industry, and I'm glad the folks in this room are making this possible, but also, please don't pull away from us because we need to work with you. We cannot go slow, and we can't get it wrong. We're gonna, we really need your help. Tonight, uh, I'm, gonna add, I'm gonna talk a little bit about where we're going in the Marine Corps. 
And more in the center of that, I'm going to talk about actually things that are some things that are not going to change. And I'm going to use as a centerpiece kind of a, the ten ring leadership. How we cultivate leadership in our Marine Corps. How do we identify the most talented leaders? How do we train them? How do we keep them? How do we mentor them? Last year, when I was privileged enough to take over as commandant, the next day I published my planning guidance on purpose that day because I was coached, tell them up front what you think is important. General Neller's assessment of the Marine Corps, before I ever became commandant, he was a commandant, and he told Congress, the Marine Corps isn't built right for the future. We're not organized, we're not trained, we're not equipped for where we, gotta, where we have to go in the future. I agree. It wasn't a bad conclusion, in other words. He was honest, which is what Marines are. And I believe the same. He stated out, in the open, so do I. That's not a bad thing to say. But what we didn't say at that time, what I didn't say is that, well, and we don't have the leadership we're going to need, because we do. We need to, we got a lot of work to do in organizing, training, and equipping the Marine Corps. Leadership, though, we're in, we're in pretty good shape, I think. General Krulak, who I draw from pretty regularly, when he was commandant long before uh, you and me, he said, I heard him say this, that the, the department, of, the military had, had become, at this is the late 90s or early 90s, he said the military had shifted to where it was focusing on things, pieces of equipment, where really, in his point, same as today, the real strength of the U.S. military is not things. It's, it's people. It is all about people. The profession of arms, the one that you and I are in, is all about people. But we had moved into a place in the 90s where we were talking a lot about things. So thankfully for the Marine Corps, I think the vast majority, I would say, every Marine understands we are a people-centric force. We need equipment, but we are, ver we, are, we are focused on the people and the profession of our arms. And we're here tonight for that reason, in other words. Tonight's about people, because that's what makes us so strong. I think it's clear, for example, I'm just going to use a couple of examples, most of which you're going to be very familiar with. Everybody in the room, I would say, knows the name Left Witch. Colonel Chambers, Gunnar Hurlburt, you know these names. Doug Zembiak, Major Zembiak, Sergeant Thomason. We all know the names. I think every one of them and us know it's all about the people. So we're going to learn more about the people. We're going to learn a little bit about the awards presented here tonight. I'm just going to take a moment to talk about sort of my words, the sort of common denominator. Among all the people that are going to be up here on the stage, there's a common denominator that I think we'll see. And I'm going to use a couple of direct quotes along the way. Sergeant Thomason, one of the awards tonight named for him, posthumously Medal of Honor. These are the, I'm just going to, not going to read the whole citation, but you'll see a trend. This is just one sentence out of his Medal of Honor citation. While leading an assault on an enemy position, he gallantly gave up his life in the service of his country. Gunnar Hurlburt, posthumously, again, Distinguished Service Cross. Quote from his citation, for extraordinary heroism during an attack on the enemy's line, during which time he constantly exposed himself to the enemy's fire without regard for personal danger, thereby assuring delivery of supplies. Left witches. Navy Cross, right? This is a part of his citation. Despite injuries by enemy machine gun bullets to his back, his cheek, and his nose, he went to the aid of a mortally wounded comrade, and although bleeding, bleeding profusely, he refused assistance and delayed his own evacuation. 
Those are just three of the citations for folks who are, we're going to hear about tonight. That, there is an element of physical courage there. We, you and I already know that. But I think more important to them than the physical courage is the, the leadership aspect of it. A central element, in other words, of, all, of our culture. One of our basic beliefs of leadership. The faith, we believe that leaders are not born. They're made. We make leaders in a lot of ways. Not the least is the ongoing efforts of a generation of leaders to teach the ones that follow while learning from them as well. The folks who will be up here on stage tonight, they can probably attest to that. They have learned from other people. They're transferring knowledge to folks, Marines, that they work with, people that you all mentor. I think the accomplishments, when we go citation by citation tonight, in other words, in their write-ups for these awards, full of the evidence of that. But there's a critical element here of how we make leaders as a Marine Corps, as a service. And that's through formal education and training. General Faulkner mentioned it before. I think the importance, in other words, of leadership is a constant, for sure. The teacher-scholar aspect, absolutely yes. That relationship, always an essential part, yes. It's always going to move us in the right direction. But we need, we rely on formal systems of education and training to raise us to that level. So I'm going to spend a couple of minutes about where I think we need to go in that, direct, in that regard. We, if, we're gonna, if you assume, like I do, that we're investing in people is our number one priority, then in investing in their training and education is at the top of the list. The most important part, in other words, of force design, the Marine Corps of the future, that doesn't change, but we will not get there unless we focus on his leadership, training, his education. That's what's got to get us there. By definition, in other words, design of a force equals the people. So we have work to do. They're not, you can't separate the two. They're not two different things. Force design includes the training and education of that organization's people, Marines. So we got to go through a, a lot of change in the next two or three, four years. That's not going to be easy. It's going to require us, I think, to modify a lot of our existing ideas of how we fight, how we organize, how we organize, and our relationships with other services, especially, I'd say, the Navy. Force Design 2030 is an, I would ask you to think of just as an aim point. I am absolutely convinced today as we sit here, what we think 2030 will look like will be different. Along the way, you and I have to be ready to adapt. As we move forward, we have to learn. We have to move faster than an adversary. I'm going to talk a little bit about what I mentioned earlier this week, if it's okay with you, sir, the intellectual edge, which to me is at the center of the training and education part. Intellectual edge is a term we use now for what in our Marine Corps doct doctrinal public publication seven, published this summer called Learning. This is, the, this is the centerpiece of it. What is that edge? In other words, in great power competition, if both of us have great technology, great capabilities, what is it that keeps us in front? I would argue to a large degree, intellectual edge. The ability to him and him and him to think faster, to recognize the situation earlier, make the right decisions. This is Marines being able to process information, make good tactical decisions. That's intellectual edge. It's the OODA loop, right? But edge meaning an advantage, push to the limit. I think the leaders in this room with us here tonight who we're going to recognize, if we arm them right, they will be able to process information, they'll be able to make decisions faster. That will give them an advantage. That's the tech, that is the intellectual edge. I think a bigger part of our decision making 
In the future, no question in my mind is going to be made at machine speed, aided by artificial intelligence. So what does it mean then for the leaders in the room? If that's the case, our decision making is going to be assisted, helped by machines. What is the human part of that? And how do we train these leaders to marry up with machine learning, make decisions faster, better decisions faster, tactically? How do we do that? I think the machine learning part, the technical skills, in other words, the challenge for these leaders, the younger leaders today, they're going to have to learn how to apply what's coming online with this up here that we can give them through training and education. Let me focus a minute on train. The difference in the military is in training, my view. The buck stops with that staff sergeant and that major. They make decisions for which they are accountable. They don't blame it, in other words, on a piece of gear. They're not blaming it on machine learning or artificial intelligence. They make decisions, tactical decisions that have consequences. That's the difference. They are accountable. We have to factor that in when we train them, when we educate them. They're using tools to make decisions faster, but in the end, it's them that are accountable. It's the tactical leader that matters. The buck stops with them. They're, the quality and speed of their decisions is on their shoulders. I think the intellectual edge, in other words, it is not something that you're born with. It's something that's made. And a central element going forward, I think, is how we do individual and unit training to raise that level up higher. Making decisions under pressure from a threat and from time, both. That's basically the same kind of training that you and I have always dreamed of. As close as possible, replicate real combat in real time with a thinking enemy. That's, who, that's how we have to train. And then you add the kind of physicality part that is so at the center of being a Marine. Now we're talking about, in our language, reps and sets. This is training. Over and over and over again to where we've seen something sort of similar to that, boom, make a 80%, 75-80% decision and go. That's what reps and sets do. I think wargaming exercises, all those things help us make decisions faster. That's training. Training for the known. See it enough times. See it enough times, I'll be able to make a decision faster than my competition. So we need wargaming. We need exercises that drive us in that direction. We're going to have a wargaming center in Quantico that we'll start building next year, all the way through the highest classification level that will put these leaders in a spot where they have to make hard decisions in real time against a thinking enemy. Even more important, I would say, than the war game, the building that's going to be built in Quantico is the force-on-force -force training that these Marines do, 29 Palms, Camp Lejeune, everywhere else. Force-on-force. -force. In other words, his competition, his competition, the adversary doesn't know what they're doing, you don't know what their plan is. And they're free to make whatever decisions they want. That's, that's as much friction as we can throw into it. That's as close as possible to real life. We have to take, my opinion, every opportunity to make that realistic, to make it suit the unit. And I think, uh, I don't think it's gonna surprise anybody, but our biggest training ground, 29 Palms, is great if you're going to the desert and the enemy's in the desert. It is not a great replication for all the places that these Marines are gonna to need to operate. We have to work through that. Preparing for the known, the training part. On the education part, separate, and I'm asking you to carve them in half. Education, I believe we educate for the unknown. I believe this is reading, this is history, this is trying to understand the theory and nature of war and combat, preparing for the unknown. Training is the known. That's our TTPs, exercising the plan, training for the known. Education, the reason we go to school, the unknown. 
put the two together and we'll have the best leaders, tactical leaders on the planet, and we do. This is all in the same kind of environment, though, where the character of war is changing. It is changing pretty fast. Now, trying to wrap our heads around all that, I think not so easy. Back to the intellectual edge. That's our margin. That's our advantage. We have to build and maintain an intellectual edge. It's not going to get any easier. I don't think there's going to be, in other words, any room in the future for going to school. You, me, get orders to go to school, and it's a year off, or it's really great to have a break. That's what it was when I went to school. We cannot afford that right now. I need you to go to school and press hard. You'll have time with your families. But the education part that we need to give you right now is training for the un is educating for the unknown. We need to up our game. In the same way that we're up in training, the reps and sets part. Come together equals the intellectual edge. That is a ton of change. I think the hard part, frankly, is going to be for people like me, because we grew up one way. For others who didn't know anything different, I don't think it'll be a change. They'll absorb it as fast as we can give it to them. The hard part, older, older Marines. We will have to change. I'm thinking about that a lot now. In a lot of cases, we were talking about at our table, I think, in other words, we will follow your lead, because it'll be natural for you. You didn't know anything us, uh, anything other than that. We have to relearn. For you, it's just bring it on. I, I got that. I got it. In some cases, I think we'll be following your lead. That's going to be an upside-down version of the Marine Corps. General Gray. A lot of this may sound uh, different or new. It is not. General Gray, 40 years ago, one of my best mentors remains so today. He drove us 40 years ago in a different direction when it came to education. He, told, he said, train, organize, and fight. We're, we must change. And he changed us probably 90 to 180 degrees different than we were headed. He gave us war fighting, the publication war fighting, which we were not at all comfortable with when we first got it. He was way ahead of his time. That shift, in other words, 40 years ago has happened, and I think again. We have to invest, though, the way he did in education. He built a great res He poured resources into what he knew the, the Marine Corps was going to need. That's what we have to do right now. The brilliance, in other words, is recognizing, visualizing where we need to go, pour the resources into it now, make the investments now. It's not about this afternoon. It's about the intellectual edge we're going to need. That's our strategic advantage. So I don't think really 40 years later a whole lot's changed. If General Gray was here, we'd all be taking notes going, let's go, okay, got it, let's go. He, he foresaw 40 years ago where, where we needed to go. Back to the point where I started though. The Marine Corps we're gonna have in the future will not be any better than the way we train and educate Marines. That will be the measuring stick. It won't be the equipment. It won't be our war fighting concepts. It won't be any of that. Whether we succeed and stay in front will be measured by how well we train and educate the human beings, the Marines. If we do that right, we'll be fine. We will get them the rest. But the more I'm around, the more I'm thinking about the human part, the individual part, the educate and train part. This is an exciting time to be a Marine. I am very grateful for tonight. We have a lot to think about, a lot to, we cannot stand parked, we have to move now. But in all this, I'm just asking you before we get on with the individuals tonight is not forget the individuals. They are the most important part. Picking them, training them, educating them, keeping them, this is what the real strength of the Marine Corps is, and we're going to see it on display here this evening. Thanks.